Okay, this is, uh, first thing I want to tell you is why what I'm about to tell you is different than anything you've heard before to kind of pique your interest in, in why this is going to be an important lecture for you. I have been a hiring manager for many years. So not like an HR hiring manager, but I've been the CEO of a lot of different companies and I've been the guy who's made that final decision. HR doesn't always, I probably shouldn't record this part, but HR doesn't always know what they should be doing for the hiring manager, even though they try to. HR folks will tell you, well, this is how you do a resume, this is how you, you know, prepare for an interview, and, and, and they're just teaching you things that they've been taught. Now, not only have I been the CEO of uh, several companies and done a lot of hiring there, and I've, I, I've been director of different departments and stuff and did hiring through that, through hospitals and through schools. So I have a lot of that background. But the other thing is that I have been, uh, I've trained, I've received some training and I've trained all my managers in my companies how to properly interview people. So there's, I'm going to teach you at a little bit higher level that you might run into in some interviews that, um, if you ran into it and weren't prepared for it, you wouldn't know what to do. So I'm going to be sharing a lot of that information with you. There are still plenty of managers out there that all they're going to do is look at your resume and go, oh, so it says you were telling me about this place, and they're going to ask you a few things, and if they feel good about you, they're going to hire you. If not, they don't. They don't know a lot of these skills. So I'm going to teach you stuff that you might not use with some interviews. At others, you definitely will. I've also been a member of uh, Vistage, which is the world's largest CEO membership group. There's about 17 in each group, uh, maximum, and we come together once a month and help each other with problems that we're having with our company. And <clears throat> most of those, and, and to be a member of Vistage, you have to be running at least a million dollar a year company, and it costs $12,000 a year to be a member. But it's been, it was worth every penny for me. Because uh, they are there to help you. You can't always ask your employees, what do you guys think about this? Because they've got a vested interest. Same with your family, same with everybody else. So you need to get a non-biased opinion. So that's why that group has really been helpful. The, uh, a lot of the things I'm going to tell you are a culmination of my own personal experiences and the experiences of the other CEOs in Vistage Group. So this is, you know, pretty well accepted stuff that I'm going to tell you about. Okay, first thing I want to talk about is f how to find a job. Okay, where, where do you spend most of your time looking for a job? Internet. Internet, okay. I go, I, go, I go straight to business to business. That's what I do. Business to business, what else? Indeed, uh, okay, <laughs> internet. Job fairs, okay. Okay, very good, very good. Ask friends if they're hiring. What? Directly to a company's website. Directly to a company's website. Okay. All right. Let me let me tell you a little bit about the balance of numbers here. It depends on the survey, but there's all high numbers. Anywhere from 85 to 95 percent, depending on the survey. Uh, of all jobs that are being filled every day were never advertised. Okay, let that soak in for a minute. 85 to 95 percent of all jobs that are being filled every day were never advertised. That makes sense? Okay, so all the time that you spend doing those things, looking on the internet, uh, uh, looking on you know their websites, even, even going door to door, if people don't know that they're hiring, how do you know you're looking for maybe 15 to 5 percent of the jobs that are out there. Okay? So I'm going to talk about the best ways to try to get these jobs over the others. And I'll also talk to you about how to be more efficient with what you are doing. Because it's still good to look on the internet and other places too. That's still a good tool. But I'm going to tell you the most efficient way to find a job. You came really close to you know, one of the key things is asking your friends, okay? <clears throat> Here's what happens. Here's what I would suggest to you. Let me put it this way. If you're trying to get into a job, especially if it's in a new industry that you don't know anybody, the very best way to get in is to volunteer with the company. Get to know people. 
there's uh, programs out there like even if it's just one day a month or two days a month or something to shadow somebody to go in if you want to get into the, I mean this is management program or whatever it is you're wanting to get into to just ask somebody hey I'm you know I'm going to college for this and you know I'd like to be able to use some of the information that I can gather from following you around for some of my schoolwork and all that so could I shadow you for two days a month or whatever you're you know capable of doing with them now by doing that it does a couple things number one is you um, gain some experience okay so you get to see what it's really like out there especially if it's something you haven't done before you also when you're done you can get a nice letter of recommendation from them okay saying that you did it that's something else you can add on to your resume but the very most important part of it is the networking that you can do so I teach uh, healthcare management at another college and some of my folks that I'm training are, uh, you know, in the process of becoming uh, ultrasound technicians or respiratory therapists or something. So, I, you know, I have been telling them, you know, go in and say, hey, can I just shadow you and follow you around? And I, and I tell them exactly, I'll tell you the same thing. Go in and tell them, hey, I'll file papers for you, I'll scrub your toilets, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I just want to be there and see what it's like. Okay, by volunteering with them and helping them out any way that you can, you get to know people. So when it comes time that you're done with this schooling and you want to go find work, you already have a group of people that you know that even if they're not going to hire at that company, they'll know some other folks. So that's a positive to get to know those people. Networking is the number one way to find these jobs. And by asking people that you know, but if you actually know people in that industry, you're way better off. Okay? Here's the way it works. If I have, this is a stack of resumes, okay? I, I hired once for an administrative assistant. We only put it on Craigslist, and it was only on there for three days, and we had 300 applications, okay? It was a couple years ago, at the height of all this problem. So I want to get through those 300. We could actually cut the ad off, because it's like, oh, we, don't, we have enough, we have enough. I'm sure there's somebody in here we can use. Well. While I had this stack sitting on my desk, one of my employees, existing employees, came in and said, hey, I've got this friend of mine who I think you might want to consider for that position. Okay, what just happened? That one person right here, that one, one possible job applicant, just went to the top of my list. And why? Okay, now for me personally, this isn't true for every hiring manager, but for me, that person at least gets an interview. They might not get hired, but they're going to get an interview. And the reason why is because my em existing employee is not going to recommend somebody that's going to embarrass them. Right? So they've already filtered this person for me that I haven't been able to do yet with a piece of paper. You can't really filter paper. Somebody who knows our company, our culture, and everything is recommending somebody, they're not going to be recommending junk okay so for I for just a second I want you to think about that neighbor or that cousin or that friend that you would like oh my gosh I could never work with this person just imagine them for a minute okay so everybody's got one if that person were to say hey can you give my resume to your boss okay would it make it to the boss Ooh, probably not and if it did I would, if, it, if I were doing it just so that I could say that yes I gave it to my boss I would hand it to my boss and say hey this is a friend of mine that wanted me to give you his resume you might want to put it at the bottom of the pile right so that way I can still tell my friend yeah I gave him your resume <laughs> but I don't want to embarrass myself because I know this person right so that will run you to the top of the list if somebody knows you and recommends you it gets you by, bypass a lot of these other people so networking is the number one thing that you can do to look for a job. All right, the other thing, the other, other ways, that, that's that 5%. We talked about, um, I'll go, I'm gonna do internet last, but let's talk about what you said, go directly to places, okay? Yeah. If you go directly to a place, what are, these days, what are you running into at most places if you go in and say, are you hiring? Well, they're getting the first 
they're getting the biggest punch of the application right in front of them because they can already judge of what they want to say to you or if they're even going to like because when they're looking at a res when they're looking at something online they don't know who you are they don't know what you look like they don't know what you re represent I agree with you but I'm going to give you a tip that will help you to yeah, what there it is right there you, you know if I run into that exactly. okay Oh, I'm sorry, we take reservations, reservations, Res, resumes or re applications online. Is that what you were going to say? Okay. So that's what happens. They can cut you off real easily. Oh, sorry, we just take them online. Okay. Here's how you do that to make this a better situation. If there's a place that you want to work, let's say it's Staples, okay? They only take theirs online, all right? Most, a lot of places do. So you fill out the stuff online, and then you take and print out a copy of what you put in online okay so you have it printed out nice well your cover let and I'll talk about cover letters and and um, and your actual resume too so you take that into the place after you've submitted it online and you let them know you say hey I'm Dennis I just want to let you know I'm you know are you the manager here can I just take like 30 seconds with you okay now you don't want to make any longer introduction than this. So yeah, I'm the uh, manager. Say, I know this you had an opening for such and such job. Yeah, we only take applications online. No problem, I filled it out online, but I wanted you to put a face with the application. Just wanted to say hello and shake hands with you. And that's it. Here's a copy of what I put online so you can put my name and face together. Shake hands and, and just leave it at that. Do not turn that into an interview. Even if they want to talk to you for a little bit, be the one say, hey, I want to respect your time. You know, if you want to set up a time to talk or whatever, that's great. But I, I only came in just so you could see who I was. And so honor that commitment that you're only going to take a little bit of time with them. Okay, because they still have to go through that process online. Make sense? That'll help you a lot with all those ones that are saying that they're online only. You get the best possible chance of getting a job. Right. And with your, if you have better credentials too, it's like you just sold it. And you don't really have to do anything else except for walk into the place if you've got the best credentials, like a bachelor or something. Yeah, if you have the credentials for the job and you've already done it online, so they don't know what to t say then, right? Because that's their line is to say, sorry, we take it online, Brr, you're out of here, right? Oh, I know, and I already filled it out, and I brought you a copy, and I just wanted to shake hands with you and say hello. Okay? All right, so that's how that works. And that's for when you're going face-to-face. -face. Now what's another one? Has anybody tried to call companies? Anybody just trying to make a phone calls and okay that's another way to try to do it. So how do you turn and the reason why I didn't see a lot of hands go up is because that's almost as scary as just walking into the place, right? Oh man, I'm gonna try this place. I'm gonna call them, call them, call them. And you call down the list. Well each of those are what a salesperson calls a cold call. You don't know them, they don't know you, you're just getting together with them and trying to find out if they're hiring or not. Okay? Well, those receptionists get those calls all day long. And they're going to tell you, go look at our website, number one, or talk to our HR, I can connect you, whatever it may be. But they're going to want to get rid of you as quick as possible because they've got other calls to handle. So here's the way that you can take, turn a cold call into a warm call. Number one is you need to have notes so you can take names down. It's really important that you get names. So let's say you want to be a forklift driver. Okay? So you call the first place. Let's say you call Lowe's uh, Big Distribution Center. You call them up and you say hello and they answer the phone. Usually they'll say their name when they answer their phone. If not, try to get it. So let's say Nancy answers the phone. Hi, this is Nancy at Lowe's. How can I help you? Hi, I am a forklift driver. I am wondering if you know anybody in your industry who might be hiring a forklift driver. Number one is you just confuse them because you didn't ask them if they were hiring, right? You were asking for a referral of anybody else in the industry who might be hiring. So it kind of throws them off a little bit and if they are hiring, they'll tell you. If not, now there's this extended commitment now to talk to you a little bit longer and may, maybe if they are aware of somebody. Well, you know, our warehouse manager moved over to the CVS warehouse and they might be looking for a forklift driver. Oh, what's his name? You know, do you have a number over there? Oh, no, I don't have the number or whatever. So you got to look it up. 
So his name's Joe, let's say. Okay, now it doesn't always go this perfect. I'm just telling you how it can work. So then you call over to the CVS and you talk to Joe. Hey, Joe, I talked to Nancy over at Lowe's, where you used to work, and um, she said that you might be able to help me. Do you know anybody in your industry who is looking to hire a forklift driver? See what I did? I took it away from him from saying yes or no about his place. But I left it open that obviously his place is in his industry too. So if he is, he'll tell me about it. So it's a softer way of approaching things. It turns a cold call into a warm call because you are mentioning names too as you call from place to place. And that helps warm things up. They don't know how you know Nancy. You might be her neighbor or you might have just called her on the phone, right? So they're not sure what extent that relationship is, maybe until later, but at least they're willing to listen to you because you mentioned somebody else's name they know. So that's a plus for you if you want to try to look for a job that way. Internet. <coughs> I think newspapers are kind of out of there. They're on the decline, so I won't even mention them anymore. But Internet, um, we already mentioned what I think is one of the great sites to go to is Indeed.com. I-N-D-E-E-D dot -E -E com. It is, if you're not familiar with it, it's what they call a spider website. So it goes and searches all the other, you know, uh, monster jobs, hot jobs, lukewarm jobs, cold jobs, all those other websites out there and returns the results to that one page. Okay, it doesn't check Craigslist and I'll talk about Craigslist in a minute. I-N-D-E-E-D -E -E dot com. Okay. Now the cool thing is once you put in your search criteria and you come up with a result, and you go, ooh, I like these results because I like the search criteria. Then at the bottom, you can set up for an alert and have it send you an email. Every night at midnight, you'll get an email of any new jobs that were added that day that fit that criteria. So you might have put it by zip code or by whatever, whatever keywords you use. You'll automatically get that. And I know because I get it every night because I have one, two, three, well, two boys now that are looking for jobs. So... I'm helping them <laughs> with that process. So whenever I get the emails with something they might be interested, I just copy it to them. So I'm helping to encourage them to leave the nest someday. So anyway, uh, I know that it works well, and it saves you then from searching all those other sites. Remember, only 5 to 15% of the jobs are actually even listed, right? I told you how to get these, the, the big numbers that, that are filled all the time. But the ones that aren't filled, that you still can look on the internet for those. Now there's a better site than Indeed. And, the, and it was mentioned already too. And I, I think you mentioned it too. Is the company's website. Okay? The company's website is the very best place to go to get the most accurate information. Because, like Hot Jobs, Hot Jobs charges anywhere from, uh, depending on what kind of area you're going to spread your ad, it might cost three, four, five hundred dollars for the company, bless you, in advance, almost got it, uh, to run that ad, for the company to run the ad. So if they're going to run it for three weeks, even though they might have found somebody and filled the job in the first week, Monster Jobs is going to run that for three weeks, because that's what they got paid to do, right? So if you're catching it when it's two or three weeks into it, and you think it's still available, and you're taking all this time to fill out all this stuff, if you didn't go to the company's website and check, you might be applying for a job that doesn't exist anymore. So the company's website is the very best place for accurate information. Okay, now I'm going to talk about Craigslist. I mentioned to you that I was a member of Vistage. So I've got all these other uh, CEOs. We're all running million dollar companies. We're all paying big money to be there. And we're talking find where do we get our best employees from? That was just one of the topics one, one day. At least 50% of us, were, we were kind of shocked actually with the results, was Craigslist. Now Craigslist, you know, we're running a big company. We could afford to run ads on monster jobs and all that stuff. Craigslist, for, for most cities, is free. They just started charging now in Inland Empire, too. It used to be only, when they first started, it was only San Francisco. Then they added L.A., San Diego. But the charge is nowhere near what it is for monster jobs or anything. It's like 25 bucks or something like that to run a, an ad for an area. Well, Craigslist, number one is you've got all kinds of wacko weird stuff on there. You've got all the multi-levels that are acting like it's really vice president of sales or whatever. 
uh, and it sounds like a real job and you call, you know you get contacting people and you know they want to meet you at a Starbucks somewhere and take an hour and talk to you about it and sell you on it so uh, <clears throat> so that you've got to weed through those jobs to find the good jobs but there are real good jobs that are on Craigslist too those of us who have put ads on Craigslist and wound up with super employees we think that this is just our own guess is that most of the folks that we've hired from Craigslist were very uh, technology savvy and they knew how to sift through all those jobs so they made it to us through a sea of who knows what on Craigslist right so as as a, a CEO of a company we like using Craigslist so that means you know there there are definitely good jobs in there but you do have to weed through them and try to tell the signs of of what's good and what's not and spend some time with that it's not doesn't have all the colored pictures and the easy to access stuff like on some of those other sites but uh, it is definitely a place you want to spend a little bit of time on okay limit your time too. make sure you're gonna you know if you're gonna take a half hour a day or whatever to look for a job you know use some of those techniques and just spend a certain amount of time each day doing those things I right, don't spend all day if you're out of work you know and telling your your husband or your wife, oh, I spent all day looking for a job. What, the 15 to 5 percent? This is where you got to spend your quality time is getting those jobs that are not listed. Okay, that's where most of the jobs are that are being filled. Okay, think that's all I want to cover on searching for a job. So now I'm going to talk about resumes and cover letters. Now a lot of people tell you cover letters are old-fashioned, you don't need them they won't even ask for it on a uh, online application but I'm going to tell you why they're important too and how to get them in there okay first thing is the resume itself at the top resume it's really good to put your name right Okay, put your name up there. Put your uh, put address here. But let me let me tell you. Here's a question that comes up a lot: is you know, especially for uh, women that are applying somewhere that, uh, on Craigslist or something. They're like, I don't know if I want to be giving my address out to everybody. Okay, let me suggest to you that if you don't feel comfortable giving your address out, number one is look at what the company is. If it's IBM or NASA or somewhere, and you I mean you know they're a real company. No big deal. Give them your address because they might actually mail you something. But if you don't know if it's, you know, Joe's Hobby Shack, you know, <laughs> or whatever it may be, and you don't know, just put your city and the state. Okay? You don't have to put the actual address of your house. But at least put the city and the state. The reason I say that, don't just leave it off, is because an employer, one of the things that we'll do is look at how far do they live from me. Okay? Uh, so they have some idea of whether or not you're going to be able to travel that distance to be there and all that kind of stuff. If you're like in New Jersey, but you're going to be moving here, then you make sure to put something like that in your cover letter, letting them know what date you're going to be available here in the, you know, in the area and where you plan on being in the area. So that'll make up for the difference there. Okay. The email address. If you are still using your email address that you had when you were 11 years old, you might want to update it if it says something silly. Okay, I actually had uh, somebody applying for a um, surgical position with the uh, tissue bank that I ran, a uh, highly you know, responsible job, whose email address was sexychick, and then a number, I won't give it to you, at hotmail.com. All right, now that's as far as I got down the resume because I didn't have a chance to read it before it went into the trash can. I just, I, you know, you can, you have to make a split second decision as you're looking through a resume, something like that on there, you go, this is not a professional person. Now maybe they are, and they just had that stupid silly name, you know, as an email, but they lost out on me even looking at their resume because of it. So we, you know, uh, as a hiring manager, we are, seriously judging the person by this piece of paper. So you need to be thinking about that while you're putting your resume together. So make sure that it's a professional 
and they're free. I mean, all the Gmail or Yahoo or whatever you want to get, just get a nice professional one and have it forward to your other one or just check it every once in a while or whatever you want to do. Okay, so make sure you've got something nice on there. You, <clears throat> you will get advice from career counselors or placement counselors or whatever at different colleges. I don't even know the ones here, so... The, uh, the ones over there already know that I insult them a little bit, but it's all meant in good They're form. Annoying. Huh? They're annoying. Are they? Okay, well then I'll... Uh, okay, so, uh, so I wind up always insulting them at every college. Now, they're doing the best they can, but I'm telling you, I'm giving you inside information on all of this, okay? A lot of them will tell you, oh, you don't need to put an objective anymore on a resume. I tell you that you should, and I don't know what if they do here or not, but I'll tell you why they're telling you that. An objective, now actually, I'm going to do this right. You're going to put one thing before it. That, however you lay out your resume is totally up to you. There is no set template that this is how you should do it for it to look the best. Okay, you can use for some variety on there. Remember that when you upload to some bigger companies, they want everything in text format and they want everything justified to the left, so make sure not to have too many bells and whistles on it so that when you can submit it uh, stand standard text, it'll st still turn out okay. So your objective, a lot of people will tell you don't even worry about an objective anymore because pe they don't look at them. Okay, well the reason that objectives became kind of something that you kind of just scan over is because almost everyone said I am looking for a company where I can use my skills to further my career and advance in my job something like that okay that's what they said well what is that me me I I me me all about me what I want out of working for you if you're gonna write an objective which I think you should you need to make sure to include what I call a what's in it for them statement, a WIFT. What's in it for them? So a good objective starts out about the same. I'm looking for a position where I can use my skills and background to increase your profitability, to improve the teams uh, at your facility, to help you grow your company, to whatever. This is your sales letter. This is your telling them what they're going to get if they brought you on board. So you, if you include a what's in it for them strong statement in there, then definitely you want to have an objective because that helps sell you to them. Okay. The, you also want to keep your, your uh, resume very short, just one page. Now some of you in here are older and have a lot more experience. I do have a resume that's more than one page, but I don't send it in first. I bring it with me to an interview, and I'll talk about that part in a minute. You can have a longer one, but you bring that with you when you go in for an interview, because then they might be looking at it in more detail. Okay, or of course, uh, uh, teachers and, and upper level stuff, they call it a, a CV, a curriculum vitae, which is basically the same thing as a resume except that it also has listed what articles you've written and books you've written and some other things too. So those are usually a little longer anyway. But you want to keep it short. And <laughs> I, I get a kick out of talking about this part, because, but this is so important. So I'm going to try to make it funny so that it'll stick in your mind. Now this, guys, we're at a disadvantage on this because girls are way smarter in this area. So you girls, I want to ask you, when you, how, well, first of all, before that, how many think that the purpose of a resume is to help you get a job? Right? Okay, there's hands. Okay. All right, I will tell you no, it is not. The purpose of a resume is to get you an interview. Okay? So we're going to talk about dating. All right? I have been married for 25 years, and my wife and I, uh, I would have to say the success of our marriage is that we haven't missed a date night probably in at least 10 years. So that's, you know, each week. Now, but way back when you're first dating somebody, you know you got some weird uncle in your family. You know you got some weird habits and, and other things that, and dirty laundry. You, are you going to bring that up when you're talking to that person to go on the first date? No, no, right? Only the best stuff. That stuff comes out later when you get to know somebody a lot better. Yeah. 
So, and like I say, girls are smarter than guys because sometimes we tend to, you know, let it let it all out, and then the, the girls kind of go, "Whoa, he's got some issues." Okay, so <laughs> we give it away. We tell everything. So your resume should be flirting with the employer. It should be trying to get the first date. It should be trying to get the the uh, interview. Now you'll remember it because that's funny, right? But it's true. You just want to get in there for the interview. <laughs> but yeah, it depends on what job you're applying for. Is that what you said? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, okay, we won't go there. So, <laughs> so th with that in mind, everything that you write here needs to be short. You don't need to tell them every job duty that you had on a certain job. You want to just talk about the highlights that relate to that particular job. That makes sense? So you just want to flirt with them. You want them to read it and think, I wonder if they, whatever. I wonder, if, oh, I wonder, wow, that's really cool. I wonder if, you want them to wonder, because the way they find out is by what? Either calling you or having you come in. So you want to leave it with some stuff missing, that, but just enough of the positive stuff that they are interested. Okay. I just had a thought. What was it here? So you're going to keep it short. Oh, this is very important. At, huh? Okay. As you're writing these, now above the objective, you're going to put some kind of highlights. Like about three, I, I like to do about three columns, and you can call it skills or highlighted skills or whatever you want to call it, that's fine. But this is, you want to entice them to read the rest of your resume. Okay? So you want to put all the highlights here, not like, you know, I knew how to empty the trash at my office, you know. No, 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 no. Just, just the most positive things up there that are related to that job that you're applying for. Pop those on there. No more than three words on each of these. These are not sentences. These are one to three words. Just key words. So that when they look at them, they go, wow, this is cool. And the same will happen with the jobs and education listing. But this is really important. And this is what most people don't realize. This is one of those secret things I told you. You're not going to hear anywhere else. Is that you've got the ad. Okay, I want you to take the ad and either, either print it out or, you know, somehow, you know, do it electronically or whatever. And you want to go through the ad and find the key words that are in the ad. So if they say something about, you know, they need somebody that's a good team player, that's one key word. They want somebody who is a, uh, 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 a leader and uh, that's great at researching stuff. Okay, now if somewhere in my resume or my cover letter I listed something like um, that I work well with others. Uh, I am a, um, uh, I'm an, uh, a great manager. And that I am great at looking things up. Stuff, okay? Terrible way to write it, but you see what I'm doing. I've got some synonym things there, okay? You know what? Don't ever do that. And here's the reason why. If it's a smaller company that you're looking for the job at, this ad was probably written by the person who's going to be doing the hiring. So these are the words that they think of when they're looking for things in your resume. So you want it to be associated as closely as possible with what they wrote in the ad. A little bit bigger companies, I applied to teach once down near San Diego, and I had to, you know, put this big three ring binder together and it had to have certain things in there and certain spots and all this. And so I hand carried it down there and while I was there, because I'm a networker, right, I talked to the, uh, the, the um, representative that was there in HR and I said, well, what, what happens with this now? You know, where does it go from here? What should I expect? And she said, well, because nobody ever really talked to her. They just dropped off their stuff. So she said, well, let me show you. So she laid out my binder. She took a binder off the shelf in the desk in front of her. She opened it up. 
it had the ad there and it had highlights on all the keywords and her job was to go through mine and look for those keywords so she goes through it she said this is what I do I look to see if they qualified for the job if so then it goes to the HR manager if not we send them a rejection letter Okay, so do you think the person that's maybe getting minimum wage that doesn't really know anything about the job anyway is going to catch that I work well with others is the same as team player? Or do you think they might just zip by it? Huh? Sounds like a dog. I didn't hear you. Sounds like a dog. It sounds like a dog. Okay, well it is just that's basically what's happening. Okay, now even bigger companies it's worse than that. It's not even a dog. It's a robot. They'll run the, they'll run your resume through an OCR, uh, optical character recognizer, okay, and it'll look at all the words, and it matches them with the keywords that were input into the system. If it doesn't see them, it spits it out. If it sees them, it moves it on to the next level. Makes it make sense? And it doesn't even have to be, a, you know, I mean, it, since they're all electronic anyway, in text, boom, it just can do it automatically. So it looks for the keywords that are in the ad. So. That implies, which is what I'm going to tell you, you don't try to make a resume and make it perfect and send the same one out to everybody. Is a job important? Okay. Is it worth an extra 15 minutes, even half an hour, to customize each of these? Yeah, because it's like paycheck and livelihood and all that stuff, right? So you need to make your resume unique for each job that you're applying okay and your cover letter I'll talk about your cover letter in a minute too okay all right so I'm going to go back now to the resume itself is this good stuff hang on a second I got a question here and then I'll come to you both both, yeah. And when I get the cover letter, I'll talk about it again. Did you have a question? Yeah, no, it, it definitely helps because, you know, there's all different kinds of resumes. And by giving, you, by giving your best um, advice for the job, it's like giving you a successful person that you are, you can kind of pinpoint the best one to pick out instead of, like, going with the ones that are just thrown together. Because you, you, know, you really don't, like, as, a, as an, an employee looking to be employed, um, you really don't know what the best resume is. You know they all work. Right. Some look better and some don't. Right. By getting this, you're able to actually pinpoint the ones that are actually the ones that they want to look at. Correct. So you're looking for the keywords. So that's what they do is look for the keywords. Okay, so the next portion is, yes? Um, I have a question. Um, you said that, you know, if you want to be personalizing it, um, looking for keywords out of the ad, would you say personal ads are the same most of the time it's not advertised? And what about the places that you're just openly applying for? Very good. If you are applying somewhere where you didn't see an ad, that's a great question. Um, what you want to do is go to their website and learn as much as you can about them. You also want to go to news.google.com and look up any news articles that are about them and look for any keywords that they use about the company and use those. Okay, great. I'm glad you asked the question because I usually forget to mention that one. Okay, very good. Uh, and also, your, if it's a friend that mentioned it, ask them as much as you can about the company and try to make a mental note of the way that they talk about it because they're going to talk in the language of that culture, right? So a lot of those keywords are going to come out in that conversation too. Okay, so we'll talk about the work experience. So when you list work experience here, a lot of times people put the name of the company that they worked at in big bold letters. So I worked at ABC Company. from this date to this date, okay? <clears throat> and what was I? I was the manager of blah, 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 and here's some of the stuff that I did, okay? That's usually how I see a resume. This is incorrect way to do it. In my opinion, everything's, you know, perfect according to what I say, but <laughs> I think this is the wrong way to do it because they don't really care if you worked for ABC Company. What they care about is what you did there. So my suggestion is that you make what you did big. So you were a 
a manager of whatever from this state to this state at ABC Company and what were some of the duties that you did. Now here again it doesn't need to be all complete sentences here. They can be short. I would not do more bullet points though anywhere else on your resume other than on the top. Because the eyes, there's a, in business communication class I talk about macro and micro writing. Macro writing is what looks nice and neat. Are there plenty of white spaces or is it one, you know have you ever seen a document or <laughs> Worst of all, a slide in PowerPoint that all it is is text and it's like all it's a square of text. I mean, you would fall asleep reading it. You don't want your resume to look like that. You want it to look nice with plenty of white space in there. So when you do these bullet points, it's to make white space. It draws your eyes right to it. And you don't want their eyes drawn to all this other stuff later on. You want it drawn to the here first because that's going to entice them to read the rest. But still make them short. They don't have to be complete sentences. Just things that you did there. And remember again, it's just like dating, right? You just want to entice them a little bit with what you did there. You don't, they don't need to know every single thing. They don't need to know that you have the key to lock up at night. Okay, you could instead say something like you were given, um, you know, leadership responsibilities or whatever you want to call it. Security responsibilities or something. And list those things there. <clears throat> and list the jobs that you had. Um, now, here, here, this is a cool thing too, is that there are no rules, okay? So, everybody thinks they've got to put their most recent job right here. And for those of us that are, that are over 20, which I am too, in case you didn't know, that, and you may have had more jobs, right? And you might be applying for something that you had a job down here that was really applied more than the job you have right now, okay? They do not need to be in chronological order. It does not need to go in chronological order. It can be in a relevance order. A relevance order is where the job that is the closest to what you are looking for. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to get to that. Uh, good question. When you list the relevance, if you would really lift it, list it in relevance order, then over here, instead of putting from, you know, 2009 to 2011, instead you just want to put two years. Okay? Next job. Put the next most relevant job to the job you're applying. One year. Whatever. Okay? Next relevant. Five years. Don't put the dates on there because they're going to be out of order. Right? Now, you're not telling any lie, and there is no rule about that you have to put these dates on here. Now, if you're filling out an application, they're going to ask it that way, and you have to fill it out that way. With a resume, though, you want the stuff that applies the most to it. Now, how are they going to find that out? If they're wondering, I wonder what years they worked? Interview, or at least on a phone conversation, right? If you have intrigued them with this, they're not going to throw your application away because you put two years on there. If you impress them with this and they have a question about this, they're going to find out from you by either bringing you in for an interview or at least calling you. And if they call you, then you can try to use your continued sales ability to get an interview. Yes, in the back and then up here. How professional would it be now, say, you work for something five and a half years? Would you put a half year? Would you just put five years? Uh, I would use your own judgment on it if five years sounds good or you can put five plus years or something maybe something like that everything as short and as simple as possible okay um, and for the responsibility that's in paragraph form not not like this okay. not in bullet points because you don't want to what happens if you put bullet points down here, what happens to the eyes, just psychologically, it's going to look at these, it's going to skip your objective, and it's going to start looking at those other bullet points. So you want to just make it, entice them so that they'll read this. Okay? The education part. When you list education, same type thing. You don't list, they, they don't care what school you went to. Right? I mean, it might matter a tiny bit, but what they really want to know is what did you get your degree in? So make that the big bold thing. Okay? If you're applying now for something, 
then you can list uh, instead of a um, you know saying that you got this degree or whatever you can put the degree and put either in progress after it or you can put a completion date if there's a specific date like when you get into a bachelor's program or something there's and you're you're on a track you're gonna graduate in March of 2014 well then put March 2014 they're gonna get it if they look if they take the time to look at it they're gonna look at it and go oh okay oh that's when they're gonna graduate because in progress they could assume that you um, are on administrative leave right now and not, process, not not actively involved in it. You know, you always think the worst. It's kind of like if when you're filling out these job things, and, and especially for ladies, if you've had a baby and you took a couple years off, you know, and there's this big gap there, you know, everybody asks, well, what do I do about this gap? Well, uh, you know now that you just put two years, three years, or whatever. But if you had the dates and there's a gap there, when people look at a resume, they go, ooh, there's a big gap here. Wow, maybe they were in prison or something. <laughs> you know? I mean, I, you know how our minds just kind of tend to think the worst sometimes? So it's always best to fill in any gaps or use the one-year, two-year, three-year thing. Okay, And you can fill in gaps by uh, st stating that you were, you know... Uh, uh, raising children or something and put down the dates whatever you know if there was a reason you took time off then that's perfectly fine to list that okay so same thing with education and then below education uh, companies are really more interested in are you doing any volunteer work with your community all that kind of stuff they want to see are you well rounded do they realize you know that if, if you're just in their gung-ho about yeah I'm gonna work you know 25 hours a day for you and that they're going to go, well, no, they're going to burn out. Is this person well-rounded is an important thing now. So you want to put any uh, community service. I need to get some new pens here. Or volunteer work. <coughs> and then... What's that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I wouldn't because my high school is so far back, right? But... Definitely. Anything within the last 10 years or so, list them in there. That's fine. If you had some leadership role in some club or something, list that. You know, if they're, Especially if you can use a key word from here in it. Right? Because remember, this is all... Don't never forget this part. This is the most important part. So you've got community service or volunteer work. Uh, and then below that, if there's any kind of certifications that are required for the job that you're looking for, or any um, associations that you belong to that are related to that. You know, for, uh, for um, entry jobs, that's not that important. But if you're applying for something, like if you're applying to be a, a nurse in an operating room and you already have that experience, well, you have to, you know, you've got your license as an RN, you've got your CPR certification, ACLS certification, all these other things, and you belong to the Association of Operating Room Nurses, the AORN member. So you list all those things if those are required for the job. Do not ever put at the bottom of a resume references available upon request. Because, number one is, it wastes space. It's a tradition that should be broken. They know, trust me, they know that if they request references, that you will make them available upon that request. They know that. So leave it off of there. I always make a big deal about it because it's just, people just do it because it's like, well, this makes it officially a resume then if I put this at the bottom, right? Everybody has kind of heard, you just put that down there. Leave it off. Okay. Now let's talk about the cover letter. Cover letter should only be two to three paragraphs. Very short and plenty of white space around your signature area and everything. So it should be simple to read. What it is, is a blown up objective. So when we talked about objective, what it should be, make sure there's lots of what's in it for them. This sucker should really tell them what's in it for them. Okay? What are the, what are the benefits of me being on board with your company? That's in here. So you don't, here you don't have to do a lot of, it, you know, adding on to what you've put here. Because we want to just tease them, right? But you just tell them basically how they're going to benefit by bringing you on board. That's what's in this cover letter. Now, 
is a cover letter important and how do you list one online too if they don't have a space for it well number one thing is that a lot of hiring managers will look at a cover letter uh, with more realization that it tells more about the person than the resume because the resume we know as a hiring manager that you had 50 people look at it and they all gave you advice and they crossed stuff out and you redid it and you redid it and you redid it until you thought you had it perfect okay which I've already told you you need to make individual one for each place anyway but the cover letter then is something that I know as a hiring manager most people didn't send around for everybody to look at they wrote it themselves last minute to send off with their resume. Dear so and so. Okay? Oh, which reminds me of something else I gotta tell you. So make sure that it is um, is written well. It's got it's really got to be correct. I had somebody applying for an administrative position that in their cover letter they started off every sentence with I uncapitalized. Okay? So I by itself is always capitalized and any word at the beginning of a sentence is always capitalized. So the fact that the cover letter had those, I never read the cover letter because this is an administrative assistant. No, no. So that one went in the trash. But I can tell more about a person from their cover letter than their resume usually. Okay? So it is important to have one. Now how do you put one online? If, if they only have an upload resume here, well then you format in Word you've, or whatever document program you're using, you put a cover letter as page one and the resume starts on page two. Okay, that's how you upload it. You're saying it's a blown up objective with two or three paragraphs. Is there anything else that should be on there? A title, a name, um, like to whom you're concerned or sincerely at the bottom? What, what, what's the title? Yes, yes. In fact, uh, this kind of goes back to hunting for a job. Okay, uh, something I... That, that relates here and it'll go into the interview too and that is researching the company so if the ad says send your resume to a smith at abccompany.com well you don't know the person's name right you know it starts with an a right and that's about all you know what you do is you go to google and you put in their email address. Now employers do this to you when you send your resume in. Okay, if they're smart they do this. Put in somebody's email address and it will tell you exactly who that is. Even if you know her name is Alice Smith. If you put Alice Smith in there you might get Alice Smith the HR director or Alice Smith the pole dancer. You know, you don't know who's who, right? But an email address is unique for that person. So put their email address in to the Google search. Now we did this with, uh, I was doing some hiring for one of my clients, hopefully I'll get to do that here at this school too. Uh, I took all the resumes into my students and we looked everybody up and, and I had the students each write a report for the employer on kind of pitching that person to them. So it was a, a cool way for everybody to see how do you do that. Well we put uh, one email address in there and it, it came up on a PDF file for the for the kids for the ladies uh, kids soccer team, you know if you have questions about the game on Saturday or whatever, give me a call and here's information about me, okay? Or you know here's my contact info, whatever. So we knew that that person's into soccer. So if you can find information about the person that you might interview with, wouldn't that be helpful? If it's something about a football game or. What, something on Facebook that they posted or something because you can get in and see a lot of stuff if you put an email address. Now I know all of you are like right now like oh my gosh I gotta go put my email address in Google. Well please do because you'll see what's out there right and that's what a potential employer, employer will see also. So try to find out what you can about the person so you can list their name directly here. Okay? If possible. If not you can put dear you know uh, HR manager or whatever. The other thing is if you can't find a name but you know that it's going to HR then you address it to you go to the uh, company's website you should do a lot of research on the company ahead of time by the way before you go in for an interview okay and before you write the resume it's helpful to do it but if you're getting interviewed somewhere you need to do a lot more research 
So go through their website. Come up with some questions you want to ask them because during the interview they're going to ask you, do you have any questions for me? And you don't want to go, uh, no. When would I start? <laughs> okay. You want to ask some intelligent questions. So you have to have done some research to ask those intelligent questions. As you're doing the research, you can go to the contact page or the information about the executives or whatever and find the HR manager, or the director of HR, or maybe the vice president of HR. Address it to them. Now this is what that does. It's probably going to go to somebody that works for them, but the fact that you addressed it to them, it's just subconsciously they're going to see their boss's name on it and it's going to just give a little bit of priority to that one. Okay? They don't know if you know them, right? They don't know what the connection is. So just because you looked up that boss's name and addressed it to them, even though they may not even see it, that adds more value to who you are. Make sense? Okay. Any other questions on this before I go into the interview stuff? And do you guys need a broadening your objective and a larger perspective for the business? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. I'm going to give you like a five minute break if you have to run to the bathroom or something like that and come back in and we'll talk about the interviewing. And there's some really cool stuff in there I'll talk about too. Okay? So you can turn it off if you want and we'll kick it back on. While you, some of you are out of the room is that if you ever want me to review your resume for you, I'll be happy to do that, but I won't do it by email. It'll only be in person with my red pen and I will show you what you need to do to fix it up. Uh, yeah, as long as I'm available, just let me know. Yeah, that's fine. It, best time, best time, just catch me after class. Just say, hey, can you look at my resume real quick? And, and I will run through it really quick. And I will look at it just like I would look at it if I were looking at hiring somebody. So you only send a few minutes, uh, you know, you spend a few minutes with it and, and roll. You can turn it on if you want. Oh, it is? Okay, good. Hi. Right. Of sure, sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you want, <laughs> if it'll help, if it'll help for closure or something. If you have so many red marks, you get <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, really. Okay. So, uh, if you want help with, uh, you know, you're gonna have an interview coming up or look at your resume or something like that. I'll do it for you, but not for your friends or your mom or anybody like that. Um, because otherwise I'll get bombarded and I'm a busy guy. So, but anybody who's ever been in one of my classes is welcome to ask me about that. Okay? All right. So now we're going to go to the interview. So they've looked at your resume. You did all the keyword stuff. They like it. And um, have decided to bring you in for an interview. How early do you think you should arrive for an interview? 10 minutes. 10, 15? No. Hour. Okay. Thirty minutes. Thirty minutes. Okay. Here's uh, more than one of you are right, and what I tell people is, arrive there about half an hour early, in the parking lot only. Okay. So that you can review some things. Don't go up there yet. Okay. Ten to fifteen minutes is is correct as far as going into the building. But arrive there early, and you're going to have a manila folder, just, you know, a little file folder thing here. And I'm going to tell you a few things that you're going to want to have in that folder. I'm not an artist, but that, doesn't it look pretty good, though, for no, not being an artist? Thank you. You can, you can lie if you want to me. So in this file folder, you're going to have at least three extra copies of your resume. Why? Because when you show up there, they might have a copy, and then a couple other people might want to say, oh, let me, let me join you on this interview. Okay, well, let me make you copies of, this, of his resume. Well, that's time. Now you're sitting there with two people that you don't know who they are, if they've joined, right? Maybe you met the manager that's going to interview. You don't know if these people are his boss or other managers there. And now you're sitting there like, huh, okay, what do we talk about? Well, he's going and get, making the copies. So, and it wastes time. So have a couple extra copies. So if other people show up, they say, oh, we're well, gonna have a couple other people join us, let me go make copies. Oh, that's okay, I've got extra copies right here. Okay, have them ready to go. That shows that you're prepared. Everything you're doing is selling. So you wanna show them that you are on the ball 
and that you were proactive in making some extra copies. Because they want a proactive employee, don't they? So that's what they're going to do. They're going to be into every single thing that happens during the interview. The other thing you want to have in there is your, uh, your references. Remember I told you the references upon request, leave it off of there? You want to bring it with you though here. I, rec I recommend on your references about five on the sheet. Three professional and two personal. Okay, just on one page, one piece of paper, print it out. The only reason you're ever going to give it to them during the interview is if they start giving you those hiring cues like, well, we like it, we, you know, if we hire you, we're going to bring in, have you fill out some other paperwork and this and that, and we'll ask you for some references. Oh, I have references, bless you, right here for you. Okay, so that, again, another proactive, wow, cool, okay. You're going to have the first page of their website printed out and in your binder, in your uh, little manila folder that you bring in there. I'll explain why. If you can print it in color, that's even better. And not like their whole first page that makes, you know, five pages. Just the very top of the very front of their first, of their website. On that, well, I'll tell you later why you're going to want that. Okay? But you want just the first page of their website printed out and in the folder. You also want to have in here a thank you card. And I'll explain how that works. You want to already have it stamped, address on it already. Just have a blank thank you card in here ready to go. And any other, uh, along with the website stuff, any other articles or anything that might have information about the company that you might want to use as reference for that moment when they say, do you have any questions for us? Okay, because while you're doing research, you might have come across something to ask questions about. That's what's going to be in this folder. When you arrive in the parking lot, your interview has begun. The reason I say that is you have no idea who you're going to see in the parking lot. So you don't put on the face and put on the, the interviewing mode when you actually get into the interviewing room. You have it ready to go when you're in the parking lot ready to go. Okay, because you don't know who you're going to see on the way in. You also don't know when you get in there and talk to the receptionist or whatever and you're waiting, you don't know if that person's not, when usually they are asked afterwards, hey, what do you think of so-and-so? Or who did you like? Because you're interviewing with everybody you meet while you're there. Keep that in mind as you're going through that process. I, I'll tell you something I did personally, and everybody has their own little systems, but I was a manager of, where was I? In Merino Valley. I was a surgical technician, but they put me in as the manager or supervisor or whatever of their central supply department. Where all the supplies come into the hospital, they you know, open up the boxes, they put them on shelves, they run them up to the departments, and they clean all the surgical instrumentation in there and sterilize it and everything. So I was a manager there, and every time I did an interview, I always wanted to have buy-in from my other employees to make sure they were okay with whoever I was going to hire. Because that just made it a little bit better. I got some input from them. So every time I did an interview down there, I would have to leave during the middle of the interview something would come up and it was on purpose they didn't know this but during the interview I would say oh you know what I hate to do this I've got this form here I need to get this down the hall to somebody so I bring them out of the office introduce them to my staff lock my door and leave for a little bit this gives my staff time to just chat with them in a casual way so what's happening is the person who's being interviewed thinks <laughs> not being interviewed right now, okay? Uh, this one gal I interviewed, and I, one of the, my other tricks is um, they needed to know surgical instrumentation. So I kept a little tray of very basic common things that people should know that know the surgical equipment. And I kept the tray in my b bottom left drawer, and I'd pull it out and just ask them to identify them, okay? So she knew all her stuff. She interviewed very well. I, I felt like she was going to be somebody I would hire, so I left the room, let her talk to the other employees there, uh, came back, finished the interview, 
said thank you and I went out to talk to my employees and said what do you think of her oh no way no way really why well what happened is they were unloading a pallet of equipment while she was there and so she was just kind of watching them and she said to them <laughs> I swear this is exact she goes you don't you don't have any guys to help you unload boxes and stuff because I get my nails done every Wednesday and boy this would be a problem <laughs> so the whole conversation she had with them they were like are you kidding we're not having a prima donna working here right so that is are you having to leave Okay, so somebody that knows his name, remind me when I take roll. So, okay. All right, and our group thing, you'll have to get with the group. So, okay, got it. Okay. Um, so, so, you never know whether there's something planned or not planned with the rest of the staff that are in there. So, your interview is not just with the person who's actually interviewing you, it's everybody. Keep that in mind. Okay, so you go into the interview, you say hello, blah, blah, blah. First thing they're going to ask you usually is, so, tell me a little bit about yourself. Okay? So, bless you. First thing I'm going to tell you is that you need to know what you're going to say. There is a thing called, uh, in human resources, they call it the me in 30 seconds. In the sales world, they call it the elevator speech. Now, let me explain how that works. Uh, the story of the elevator speech has been told in many books for I think it's been over a hundred years. Well, I don't know when elevators were invented, but <laughs> it's uh, it's been around long enough that whether the story's true or not, it's true now because it's been told so many times, right? But there was a sales guy that had an uh, an account that, or not an account, but a potential account that he knew they could really use his product. It would help their company. They were a big company, so number one is he'd make some good money, and he knew that they would be happy with the product. He'd already talked to purchasing. He'd already talked to the management of the department that would use his product. It was just down to the CEO of the company giving the okay. That was it. So he arrived. He actually went there twice before and had an appointment and something came up and the CEO couldn't see him. So this is third time, right? Third time is supposed to be a charm, right? Or you strike out, right? So he's there for the third time. He goes to the building. He's up on the ninth floor. So he rides the elevator up. And he's in there and he's talking to Mary. He knows Mary because he's been there twice before, right? So he's sitting there. Mary offers him some water and they chit chat a little bit. And then uh, the phone rings. Mary answers the phone and she says, uh, Oh, yeah, he is. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll let him know. All right, thank you. So you know what's going to happen, right? Here's number three. She says, I'm really sorry he had something come up. Can I reschedule it? No, that's okay, Mary. You keep your happy face on, right? Yeah, that's okay, I'll call you later, we'll reschedule it, no worries. Inside you're going, ah! You've got this like, yeah, I know, you want to hit a wall or something. you got this 30 minute presentation you've prepared for this guy and you've got it down pat and ugh, you're frustrated. So you go out, you hit the elevator and as the doors are closing on the elevator, you feel your whole world closing behind you, right? And so you just kind of, well, you know how sometimes somebody catches the elevator door so he sees fingers come in and somebody catches and so he tries to kind of brush up a little bit. And in walks the CEO that he's not had a chance to meet with yet. So he has to, if he does not already have an elevator speech prepared, he needs to be able to say something to the CEO that next time he has an appointment, he won't break it because he's going to want to hear more. So he's, he can't randomly out of this 30 minute presentation he has in his head, pull things out last minute to tell the guy. He's got to have something ready to go. Right? So you have to have an elevator speech ready. If you're in the grocery store and your neighbor sees you and says, hey, I heard you're looking for a job. What kind of work are you looking for? Or what do you do? What would you say? And I, and I know you're not ready. Okay? But you see what I'm saying? If I said that to right now to any of you, so tell me, I got 30 seconds. I'm next in line. Right? Okay, the me in 30 seconds. So, to, oh, what, what kind of work do you do? What are you looking for? I'm going to check out in a minute. So, you can't stumble. You've got to have it ready to go. That is what you're going to do at the beginning of the interview is tell them a little bit about yourself. You're going to give them your me in 30 seconds. Okay? Look it up online if you want. 
I could go, this is, the stuff I'm show, sharing with you tonight, I have taught as an eight hour class. Okay? So I'm honestly just hitting the highlights for you. We go online, you can look up me in 30 seconds template, and you'll find a bunch of other, you know, a bunch of sites that'll give you an idea of what to say, how to say it. One of the real kickers at the end, yes, me in 30 seconds. Or you can try elevator speech too. That's not about a job, that's about for sales, but it'll give you some other tips too. The real clincher at the end of the me in 30 seconds, just to give you a rough idea and not spend a lot of time on it, you basically want to say what you've done, what you're looking for, and then you end it with, and this is so cool, is, you know, I'll tell you, I enjoyed working there and most of the people that worked with me said that I was the, mo the most detail-oriented person they ever worked with or the most productive person they ever worked with. My last boss said that I was more productive than any other employee ever worked with. So what did I just do? All by myself, I just gave a reference. So when you end with a reference, it's like a third-party endorsement of you. So when you do your me in 30 seconds, try to always end with a little reference. Okay? All right. Let me rock and roll on now. <clears throat> During the interview, some of the things that they might do, if they are highly trained as interviewers, then they will ask you what are called behavioral questions. Is anybody familiar with behavioral questions? Okay. So when you go for an interview with somebody that's not experienced, they're going to just look at your resume and say, well, tell me more about such and such. Tell me more about this. Well, it has been really proven in a lot of tests that if I were to ask you something, I'm, I'm going to give you a scenario, or, or you're, I'm going to say, hey, to almost every behavioral question starts out with the words, tell me about a time when. Okay? Because here's the thing. If a, a an applicant tells you about what happened before in a certain situation and they're telling you the truth, then if they were to be faced with that situation again in the future, chances are highly likely that the same thing would happen again. Okay? Now, so if I ask the question, tell me about a time when, and I'm talking about teamwork, okay? Tell me about a time when you were on a team. You, it says here on your resume you're a, a great team player. Okay, so tell me about a time when you were on a team that you were a good team player. Okay, be ready with some of these stories, right? Because you don't want to be like, uh, huh? A sport. Well, they may ask you. Well, if they say just tell me in general about it, yes. But if they ask you about, tell me about about a time you were at work on a team, well then you can't use that story. So you got to have a bunch ready. Okay, so be preparing as much as possible for these type of questions. Now, if they're highly trained, like I trained my managers, is they'll use, is anybody familiar with NLP? Neuro Linguistic Programming? Okay, there's a lot about no, the nonverbal that goes on. You do some research on it, some of you will have a new hobby because you'll get into it and go, wow, this is really cool. There's an eye pattern movement that you can tell when you ask people questions, whether they move their eyes to the right or to the left, to the left or up, left, you know, to the side. Neuro linguistic programming, NLP, and you can look up eye movements. I have some videos on it and stuff too, but I don't. I show them in other classes, uh, psychology classes and stuff when I teach those. But uh, if you typically, if you are right-eyed. Or left, you can be right-eyed or left-eyed, okay? It doesn't matter if you're right-handed or left-handed. It honestly doesn't make a difference. But if you are right-eyed and I asked you about, um, to tell me about a time when you were uh, something visual. If I asked you, uh, oh, you said you were at the circus yesterday. So what, hey, what, I, I think I saw those when I was driving down the road. What color were the tents? Okay. You're gonna, if you're right-eyed, you're gonna look up and to the left to remember what color those tents were. Because you're, we read from left to right, so we tend to go back here, visual is up here. I'm not gonna go too deep in all this stuff, but I'm just telling you, you'll do that. If you're, gonna, if you're making it up, you weren't really at the circus, you're gonna look up to the right and, and create something, okay? So a good interviewer will know whether you're telling the truth or not. Uh, police and military and all that that interrogate people, they understand all this stuff too. 
So a good hiring manager, a good interviewer knows some of this stuff too. So armed with that and asking a question that is a behavioral question, you get a good, a much better opportunity to find out what that person is really like during the interview process. So tell me about a time when. All right, I'm going to now add another tool that's like way kick above everything else for you, okay? So you get prepared for that part, is visual cues. Okay, I'm gonna talk about visual cues when you talk. <clears throat> it, think about what you're thinking about right now while I say the word dog. And elephant. Okay, did you think of the letters D-O-G? Or did you actually picture your dog or Snoopy or, right? You probably pictured an item, right? And you also didn't think of E-L-E-P-H-A-N-T, right? You pictured a big gray thing with a big nose, right? So your mind remembers pictures much better than concepts or words or anything else, okay? So just keep that here in the corner for a minute. I'm going to answer the question. So you guys are the interviewer and you just asked me, tell me about a time when you were on a team at work and you showed that you were a good team player. Okay, so I'm going to give a good answer first, and then I'm going to give a different answer with visual cues, and I want you to see the difference. Okay, well, I remember it. We were working on, I'm a contractor, I'm a, uh, what do you call the guy that runs a crew? Foreman. foreman. Okay, I was foreman for a team, we were building a bridge. And I remember we were working on the bridge, and everybody wasn't getting along that well, and it was mostly because of this one guy. After work, the guy comes up to me, his name's Jim, and he was talking to me about why he didn't feel like he felt fit in. And I gave him some tips. I told him to talk about some common interests that the other people have and get to know them a little bit. And then he would be friends with them a little better and they might communicate better in the work environment too. So he did that and he became you know, a better part of the team. So that's how I was a good team player, okay? Not bad, right? Good answer. Now, let me tell you this way. I'm going to answer the question with visual cues. Oh yeah, I remember like it was yesterday. We were working on a bridge. We were still in the, the steel framing uh, part of the bridge yet. Nothing else had been put on yet. So you have the big gray beams up here and he's up on a rope, this guy named Jim. And he's not getting along with people. They're not communicating very well with each other. Uh, you know, we're all wearing our, our big yellow hard hats, and it's kind of hard to hear anything anyway, but he's just not really paying attention to them. Well, he realized he wasn't getting along with them, so after work, he came by my office, and I had one of those, you know, big gray metal desks with the squeaky drawers and stuff, the big wooden top on it, and I was sitting there, and he was still in his orange safety vest and just came in and asked me what he could do, and I said, well, maybe you ought to talk about football or baseball with the you know, with the other members of the team and get to know them a little better and, and you'll work better with them on the, on the uh, workforce, you know. And it, it helped, okay? So tell me now, in that second story, where were you in your mind standing near me on the desk when I was talking to the guy? Where did you picture yourself? As I was talking about the big metal desk and stuff. What, huh? You were in the room, okay. What color were our hats? Yellow. What color were the vests? Okay. What color was the bridge we were working on? Okay. And so where were you in the room? Were you standing over by Jim? Were you behind me? Were you, where were you? Where were you? In front? Okay. Anybody else? Where were you? If you're remembering what I told you. By, by Jim, behind the desk. Okay. So all of you were, were there, weren't you? Right? In a way. Here's, here's the benefit of using visual cues. And salespeople use this a lot too. By using visual cues, you draw somebody in, you make them feel part of it. So not only did I just tell you the story of what happened, but you were there. Your mind doesn't know the difference. Subconsciously, it's validated that that's what happened because I, just because I used some visual cues. Make sense? Okay. The first time I didn't tell you we were in our office, I didn't use any visual cues, so you don't, you were just listening to a story. So those are all some basics for handling those kind of questions. Okay, I'm going to wind down the rest of the interview here. Um, 
they're going to ask you, do you have any questions for me? When they do that, you open your folder up and say, yeah, actually I do. You have that website in there. If there was something on the website, on that first page, that will trigger a question you're going to ask, then highlight it. If not, write your question that you're going to ask them during the interview on the sideline. Okay? Why are you doing that? Because when you pull that out of there, you don't have to show it in their face. They're going to recognize that's their website. So they're going to know that you were proactive in researching about them. You're not out there just to find a job. You actually have some interest in learning what the company is all about. So without saying anything, you just said a mile of stuff. Because they can see that you did that work. Make sense? The biggest fear that a applicant has is that they're not going to get the job. But you know the, the employer has a fear too. Their biggest fear is they're going to let that perfect person leave without hiring them. So if you can do a lot of these things to show them that you're proactive, you brought the stuff that you need, you've done research on them, you're ready with some questions, you can talk about yourself, that's going to show them that you, you are confident in who you are and that you want to be part of their company. Now, the last part of it is that <clears throat> at the end of the interview, if you want to work for them, Okay, if you felt like this interview went well, I like them. That's not always the case. I mean, I remember going on an interview once that they were moving furniture out of an office next to me. There were no pictures on the wall in the office space. <laughs> it just felt like kind of temporary. <laughs> so I didn't feel good about it. I was hoping they wouldn't hire me, one of those kind of jobs. But if this was an interview that went well and you thought you want it, then at the end you need to make sure to let them know that you want to work for them. I, I can't tell you how many employees or applicants that I've asked, why do you want to work for us? That's one of the questions I ask in the interview. Why would you want to work for us? I would have to tell you at least 40% of them have said, well, I'm just looking for work in this particular field or I'm just looking for a job. Wow. Those guys never made it past. Because I want to know, why do you want to work for me? If you know nothing about my company, and you came in here to interview to work here just because you want a job. I'm not in business to hire people. I'm in business to make money and other people that want to join me in that process or if I'm a nonprofit, I'm in business to uh, you know, accomplish a, a mission and people I'm going to hire need to have that same vision. Not just because I want a job. So by this little piece of paper thing, it may not seem like a big step to you but there's a lot that's being said when they see that you did a little bit of research in their, on their company. So at the end, if you want the interview, excuse me, if you like the interview and you like the company and you want to work there, then at the end you let them know, hey, I appreciate your time and I am interested. In, I hope that you'll consider me because I would like to work for you. Yeah, yeah. Okay? So I'm letting them know I would like to work for you. I don't want to end with something like, when should I expect to hear from you? That's an okay question to ask. But earlier, not right at the end. You don't want to end with a, where it feels like you're pulling little strings to, how do I stay attached to you guys? You want to firmly let them know you're interested in the job. And, and, and you can use a visual cue here, too. I can see myself standing over there in the computers, working in that computer room with those guys, blah, blah, blah. Maybe mention some names if you know some people. Okay? Help them to envision you in that position by using visual cues in your comments. Yes? I look forward to hearing from you. Look forward, right. I mean, but, but, it's, but if you say something, does it seem like you're weak? Or does, it, does it somehow not project the same? Right. No, no. I think it, it's good to say it it's strong. I look forward to talking to you in the future. So, like if I hope to, or maybe, maybe we'll hear from you. You don't want to use any wishy-washy words there. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. I look forward to hearing from you. Whether I do or not, the, that doesn't matter. And you don't want to bring that up there. You don't, have, you don't need to be technically correct with them. That, well, they're not going to def definitely call me, so am I really going to look forward to it? That kind of thing. Okay, so I would suggest always using strong words. Not like, you know, I expect you to call me. <laughs> you know, that's too hard. But just, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I am not going to eat until you call me, you know. I mean, you want to say, I, I look forward to you calling me, right? Huh? <laughs> okay.
I set a bomb in one of the other. If they don't call me, I'm going to no. know. So you just you leave with some positiveness and, and let them picture you in the company and go from there. Okay, now I'm going to talk about follow-up. This is the very last part because this is always the panic of what all... I haven't heard from them. What do I do, right? I don't want to sound like an idiot or a pest. Here's what you do. I'm going to give you word for word what to say when you call on a follow-up call. So you should jot these down. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So what you'll do is, if they give you a date, if they say, we should be making a decision by Thursday, and they, you haven't heard from them by Thursday, then call them Friday. Okay? If they say, we don't know when, because we still have more people to interview, give them three to four days, no more than that, before you call back. Okay? Here's what you should say to them. Now you can, I'd like for you to work, write it word for word, but you can change it a little bit you know, for your own personality or whatever later, but at least get the wording down. Because some of it is important, and I'll explain which are important and why I'm using the words that I use. I, I've probably got at least 10 or 20. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention at the beginning, too, that my wife and I actually volunteered with our church for a while, and for two years we trained people and helped them, you know, with uh, job placement and all that stuff. So we kind of served a little mission doing that. And uh, I've got at least 10 or 20 experiences where people have used this word for word and it has helped them a lot. So I'll share at least one of those experiences with you. But here's what you say. You call up, hope, hopefully you get in touch with the person who interviewed you. You remind them who you are. And you let them know, say, I wanted to let you know, I wanted to let you know, I'm considering some other options right now. But I liked your company the best and wanted to find out where you're at in the hiring process. I wanted to let you know that I'm considering some other options right now. Now that's not a lie. The other option might be that you're considering looking up on the internet some other places that might be hiring and sending out some more applications. That is another option, correct? So I am considering some other options right now. But I liked your company the best. But I liked your company the best. Or I liked your job the best, or whatever it may be. Okay, how are you? If you want to reword, I'm just giving you straight how I have it memorized, and you can adjust a little bit. But I liked your company the best. But I liked you guys the best. You gals the best. Whatever you can change it a little bit. So, <clears throat> but I liked your company the best, and wanted to find out where you're at in the hiring process. And wanted to find out where you're at in the hiring process. I wanted to let you know I'm considering some other options right now, but I liked your company the best and wanted to find out where you're at in the hiring process. That's short, that's sweet. Here's what it does. Number one thing is you hit their biggest fear. The biggest fear that I've always had and any other hiring manager has is that we're going to not hire a really great employee. And worse than that, the real fear is that they would go to work for a competitor. Okay? So what did I say? I'm considering some other options right now. Whoa! That's the biggest fear. Okay? But then what did I do? I enveloped it with a warm blanket. But I liked your company the best. Whoa! Okay? So I hit the fear, but just shortly, and then gave some happiness with it. Right? I liked your company the best. And then you don't ask something as a uh, as internally in a company, the hiring process is a phrase that is used quite often. So if you ask somebody, want to find out where you're at in the hiring process, you aren't asking about, have you decided on me? Have you hired somebody else? All those things that are going to kind of feel like it's all about you. You just wanted to find out where they're at in the hiring process. So it kind of takes you out of it and makes it a little softer. And it's terminology that they're very used to hearing. Okay. Now, if they hired somebody else, they'll let, they'll let you know, or whatever. If they haven't yet, they'll let you know. Your whole goal, anyway, was just to call and find out where they're at in the hiring process, right? So that phraseology works really well. I had a sales manager. This is the one story I'll tell you. And then I'm going to give you your challenge and stuff, and you guys can work on it either here, or you can communicate through those group things, okay? And we'll go that route. So, <clears throat> here's the success story with that, one of them. 
This guy was a sales manager. He had been a regional sales manager for a company. My wife and I had worked with him. We did the training and all that stuff, helped him with his resume and stuff. He was interviewing with a company out in LA to be their national sales manager. So this was like a move up from where he was before. He felt really good about the interview. He called me up and said, hey, I, I went on that interview and I haven't heard from them. I said, how long has it been? He said, a week and a half which is like way beyond what I told you you should call back, right? I said, did you write down what I told you to do for the follow-up? Oh, no, I didn't write it down. I said, okay. So I gave it to him again over the phone. He used it. He called up. He had met with the president and the vice president of that company for the interview. He felt the interview went real well and hadn't heard anything. So he called up. The president wasn't there. The vice president was and remembered him. And he told him that he's considering some other options right now but that he liked their company the best and wanted to find out where they're at in the hiring process. And the vice president told him, he said, you know what, can I, can I call you back in about an hour? Okay, now the story I'm telling you includes some information that he told me later after he got hired and stuff too. What had happened was the vice president and the president had decided they were going to hire him a few days before. The president was gone somewhere in Colorado and he was on his cell phone in an airport in Colorado and their company policy was that all national jobs like national sales director, national trainer, national whatever had to be hired by the president not the vice president. Okay, So the vice president called up the president and said hey you remember that guy that we interviewed for the national sales manager job? Hey he's considering some other options right now but he did mention that he liked our company the best and he wants to know where we're at in the hiring process. So the president told the vice president, look, I'm going to go against protocol. I don't want to lose him to anybody else. So call him back and bring him in and hire him. I'll let you do it this time. Even though it's against company policy. Because they were afraid of losing him. All right. So the vice president called him back within the hour, had him come back in the next day and hired him. Okay. Now I'm not saying that these words will help you get hired every time. I'm just telling you, it helped to move it along faster. He got hired almost a week earlier than they had plan on hiring him because those words are key. You hit their biggest fear, you give them that warmth of I liked you the best, and you asked in a very nice kind way. Okay? Alright, is that stuff? I gave you a lot of information. Key things are keywords, right? Make sure the ad has keywords here. Oh, I forgot to tell you about the thank you card. I'm going to tell you about that. Before you do the follow-up, when you're done with the interview, you go down to your car and you fill out the thank you card. Not a letter, not an email. Scrap that. Cards are hard to throw away. And they don't get stuck in a pile like every other letter. Okay? So you go to your card, you say, I appreciate your time during the interview, and throw in something personal that happened that they're going to remember who you are. Which means that during the interview, you need to make something personal happen if it doesn't just automatically happen. So if you walked in for an interview and somebody was wearing a tie very similar to yours and they said, hey, I like, I like your tie, you know, because you're wearing about the same color tie or something. Then in the thank you note, say, it was, I appreciate your time. It was great being by, interviewed by somebody that had a great taste in ties. All right. Or if the guy ran late because he said, hey, I'm sorry I'm a little late, but I was able to break off at lunch and go see my kid. Uh, hit a home run with his baseball team or something. Then make sure, hey, I was really glad to hear your son did well. And it's, any, anything that would be unique to your interview, put it in that thank you card. Now, why do you have it with you here and don't go home and send it out? The reason that it's in your car with you and in that folder is that if you had interviewed in Rialto, let's say, okay, you came back here to Menifee or wherever you live and you fill out the thank you card and you put it in the mail right away. Okay, it has to go through a processing center in San Bernardino. It's going to take probably two days to get to them. If you filled it out right there in Rialto, found the closest drop box that you can put it in, put it in there, it goes to the Rialto Little Post Office. They are sorting through their stuff. What goes to San Bernardino? Oh, this one stays here. It will get there the next day. Okay, that's why you want to take it with you. So a lot of little tips and cues in there. But th that's the way that will help you so that you can be remembered also. Okay? Any questions? Okay. Is that helpful? I know I gave you a lot of information really fast. Okay. Thank you.
Okay, and those are some real proven things. Okay, that's good. You can kill the 